This is the Nike Vaporfly Next Percent, the shoe that has rewritten the record books in the world of running. Today we are going to look at why it's been so controversial and what makes it so fast. So Jeff, let's talk about the Vaporfly and what makes it so good. It's as light as any racing flat you can buy, yet it's still soft and very responsive. But how did we get here from these shoes that we have here? Yeah, when you look at this shoe, I mean, it's thick. It looks like it's a big, heavy shoe, right? But it's as light as any of these shoes on the table. It's actually lighter than any of these shoes. This was the, the typical kind of racing shoe we had for a long time. It's flat, it's low to the ground. It uses EVA. This is the New Balance 1400 that I raced in a lot. And the goal was, with racing flats, was the lighter shoe was the faster shoe. So you wanted nothing. I mean, you can see through these uppers. This is hard foam. Right. Then Boost came along around 2012. And so the shoe you're holding here, it's still thin. It's still low to the ground because Boost was heavy. This midsole material is really uh, responsive. When you sink into it, it returns a lot of energy. In our labs, the energy return was off the charts. But it's a thin layer because it's really heavy. This was the shoe that evolved and people started setting world records in. Right, this was Dennis Cometo's shoe, which was, if I remember correctly, the last shoe prior to the Vaporfly era to break uh, the marathon world record, right? Yeah, undeniably, it was a fast shoe. It was a racing flat built for the marathon. That boost foam saves your legs a little bit. Now comes Peebax, and this material, it's thick, but it's so lightweight and so airy that you can really get the benefit of the cushioning without paying the weight penalty. So it's as light as those shoes, it's as fast as those shoes, it's going to save your legs. There's some other really neat stuff that's happening inside here we're going to talk about, and then we're going to look at how it actually relates in the real world when we throw you on the treadmill. Fantastic. Well, I brought my fast legs today and we're going to go and compare these shoes head to head and see how the difference in the foam, the construction, affects my running economy. And then we're going to put this shoe through the bandsaw and we're going to look inside and see exactly what makes this shoe so special. Alright, so we have Dan's young legs up here on the treadmill and it's speed day for Dan. We got him running at 11 miles per hour on the treadmill, which is about a 530 mile. Now we tested the 4% shoes in the Runner's World Shoe Lab and we're recreating that test here so we can get a sense for how these shoes perform at speed. What we saw in the lab and what we expect to see here is that at a steady speed held by the treadmill, he's going to run with a longer stride length, a lower cadence, and a lower heart rate in the Nike Vaporflies. I tell you what, the Vaporflies feel so much sketchier to run on the treadmill. <laughs> ah. oh, I try not to look that tired. And I was watching the data in real time on my watch because I had your sensors synced up, so I threw it into Garmin here. And what we can see is you ran five and a half minutes in each one, each shoe. And the Vaporfly is the top shoe, the Adios is the middle, and the 1400 is on the bottom here. And if we scroll across, we can look at your heart rate. Your average heart rate was lower in the Vaporfly and climbed up as you went along. You maxed out at 195, which was fun watching you get up that high. You topped out at 188 in the Vaporfly. But what might be a more telling stat is we did see your average run cadence. It's not, it doesn't look like a big deal here. You were down at 187 average for the Vaporfly and a little bit higher for the others. You were over 190 a lot when I was watching in real time. It then. felt like it, yeah. Um, but we can see here also in your uh, average ground contact time. Now we're talking milliseconds here, so this is a pretty small thing. Um, you were on the ground 209 milliseconds in the Vaporfly and a little bit longer in the other two shoes. So you're spending more time on the ground. Again, this isn't highly scientific. It's not like what we did in the Runner's World Shoe Lab when we first tested the 4% shoe and a little bit more controlled environment, but it was something fun here at the office that we can do to sort of recreate this scenario and see, is there something to the shoe? Right, and what's interesting about the ground contact time is that if I just had to guess and I didn't know anything about these shoes, I would have guessed that I was on the ground for longer. But the data shows the exact opposite. The New Balance had the longest ground contact time, Boost was right in the middle, and the Nike uh, was the least amount of time on the ground. Now that we've seen what you do in the shoes, let's look inside the shoes to see uh, what the materials are that are making this happen. Well, 
what we typically had was a really thin midsole. You can see this isn't really thick on the older shoes. But by comparison, the forefoot of the older flats were really close to the ground. Look how thick this forefoot on the Vaporfly is. There's a lot of foam underneath there. And even in the heel, there's a ton of foam. You can see this black line running through. That's the carbon fiber plate that everybody talks about and they think it's a spring. We're not quite sure exactly how it's interacting, but we do know one thing from lab testing and from what we've seen. It basically stiffens the shoe. Most of these shoes have some kind of stiffening agent in them, by the way. And what it does is it extends the forces so you have greater force way out here at the tips of your toes when you're towing off. Uh, than you do in other shoes where you might have the force greater further back underneath the ball, the foot. But you're really getting the benefit from this foam. This foam is very soft. It compresses really easily, but it rebounds really quickly and takes its shape again and is ready for your next stride. So it uh, continues to deliver excellent cushioning throughout the course of your marathon. It's also super lightweight unlike the Boost, that'll give you a lot of cushioning, but you're gonna pay the weight penalty as well. So over the course of a marathon, that's gonna equal time. It's gonna slow you down. This plate here that they ran in, it's not just a straight plate through there. It's curved. You can see the, the sharp right. arc there. And people have talked about this in the past. What that really allows you to do is have a little bit more comfort because it is so stiff. The first thing I noticed ever stepping into a Vaporfly was that forefoot. The amount that you can just sink in is incredible. You don't get that with you know shoes like the Adidas and the New Balance that use more traditional constructions. And as good as this shoe is, you don't feel that. The other thing too, I mean, if we were to flex these, you can see how much the Adidas is willing to flex with the boost and no plate. This thing, I mean, cutting it in half does help it flex, but it's still, you see that flex is kind of more evenly distributed across the shoe like you were talking about. Yeah, it's a very stiff shoe regardless. When you put it on, you really feel it, and you can see why now with that plate there. In the Runner's World Shoe Lab, when we did the testing originally on the 4%, we actually measured muscle activation and found that uh, various areas were activated less in the Vaporfly than in other shoes, corresponding to really just using less energy. You can do that, and you can get down the road further at the same speed using less energy. That's gonna keep you fresher for later in a race. Yeah, I remember my first Boost shoe, and it was a similar thing, but nowhere near the magnitude of running in the Nike for the first time, which, you know, based on the treadmill data and what we've seen here, it's very difficult to argue that there isn't a serious technological advantage. I don't think EVA is dead, however. I mean, we have these new materials. This is a PBAX based foam. It's really expensive though. That's why the shoe costs $250. I only use these on race day. It's a tool in my toolbox for going as fast as possible on race day. I don't even wear them for workouts. I'll pull out the 1400 or something like the Adios for workouts feel plenty fast, but then get that extra little bit of benefit on race day through the next percent. Well, Jeff, now that we know how these shoes work, what does this mean for the average runner? Well, so it's undeniable that tech is here. I mean, th these shoes are radically different than what we had. And really, we're gonna have this from whatever brand you prefer. Nike got there first, um, but they're not the only ones working on it. We've got people working on other shoes from other brands. Whether you wanna run a 50K, Hoka made one of those, something for longer. Whether you want a purpose-built shoe for a mile, New Balance made one that's just built for going a mile on the road. Nike built these really for the marathon specifically, but you see people running in them from 5K on up. So every brand is working on something they're using these materials to make the fastest shoe. So it's undeniable that the tech is here, and it's, it's a lot of fun to run fast and feel fast, right? It is, yeah, um, and that's the question going forward, you know. Is this about putting an asterisk on performances? Is it about shoe doping? So tell us in the comments, are you upset that these shoes are influencing performances, maybe at your local 5K in your age group, or are you excited that you can run faster than ever and achieve your goals with the help of new technology?